the Swiss mountain in mathematical physics. Uh, you received in 84 the Lassis Prize, 91 the Danny Heinemann Prize, 97 Marcel Benoit Prize, 1901 the Max Planck Medal by the Max Planck uh, Society, in 2009 the Poincaré Prize. You're a member of various prestigious academies. Uh, with that, uh, I'll hand uh, the word over to you, Jörg. Thank you, Stefan, for the kind introduction. Uh, obviously, in these times, uh, the theory of interacting bosigases may not be the most burning issue, but that's what I've been told to talk about. So, uh, so let's look what we can say. So let's develop a little perspective. This lecture is about, you know, it's a sort of very modest chapter in quantum mechanical many body theory, a subject that includes the theory of interacting quantum gases. That's one of the topics today. Quantum liquids, if you think of Landau Fermi electron liquids, which were investigated a lot by uh, my colleagues in the math department, by uh, Manfred Salmhofer and various Italians. Then solids, crystalline crystals, insulating materials have become very popular if you think of topological insulators. So it's really the theoretical basis of condensed matter physics. The theory is supposed to describe lots of interesting phenomena, such as Bose-Einstein condensation in three or higher dimensional interacting Bose gases, the Castellet-Thales transition in a two-dimensional Bose gas, or in a, supercond a two-dimensional superconductor, various manifestations of superconductivity, such as BCS theory, high TC superconductivity, the quantum Hall effect in interacting two-dimensional electron liquids in an external magnetic field or in rotating bo Bose gases. Unfortunately, not very much is known about the mathematically rigorous quantum mechanical description of these and other related phenomena. Although one has to say that during the past, say, 25 years, a lot of progress has been made. So for the, since we, we are still faced with a lot of difficulties, uh, one of the standard strategies is to study limiting regimes and idealized models that reduce the mathematical complexity a little bit and it might enable one to come up with mathematically precise results. And uh, this lecture is really basically about this strategy. I will start telling you what bo both gases are, and then I will look at various limiting regimes where I believe one can say much more than one might expect. So let's get started. Oops. All right, so here is a little abstract. In this talk, I will review some recent results worked out by Antti Knowles, Benjamin Schlein, and Vedran Zohinger on the quantum theory of interacting both gases. Uh, if you want to read more about many body theory, you might also want to have a look at my Lesouche lectures from the year 1994 that uh, you know summarize a lot of things in different areas, or at my 2018 lectures uh, at Bad Honef uh, that focus on topological insulators. In any event, today we will just look at Bose gases. I will make use of a representation of Bose gases as a kind of scale of field theories resulting from a Hubbard Stratonovich transformation. Then I will remind you of Gini Busbanian loop representation of Bose gases. Then I will look at an interpolation in the number capital N of atom species in the gas. We can look at Bose gases that contain many different species uh, of particles. And then finally, I will look at simplifications appearing in various limiting regimes, for example, in the mean field limit that has been quite popular in recent times, the large end limit, 
or the small n limit, the n tends to zero limit, which is also of interest. And I will also uh, describe some novel support for the conjecture that lambda phi to the four theory in dimension greater or equal to four is non-interacting, no matter how many components the theory has, phi in this, uh, uh, phi denotes a complex scalar field with you know, as many components as you like. I should give a little credit to many colleagues. Uh, certainly, Bavaban, Feldman, Knörr, and Dubowitz have investigated Bose gases with the idea of perhaps being able to prove Bose Einstein condensation for rather many years already. There are, of course, all the classical results, starting with Dyson, Bogolyubov. And then the Lieb, Lieb and the Libyans have produced many results. Recently, a paper by Mathieu Levin, Nam, and Rougerie appeared that uh, deals with the mean field limit in two and three dimensions and has some overlap, at least result wise, with what I'm going to talk about. And then Manfred Salmhofer has just published. Uh, a preprint where he uses functional integral methods to investigate Bose gases that just came out, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago or four weeks ago, I'm not quite sure. Probably also has some overlap with what I'm going to talk about. So I thank all these colleagues for informing me about their important results. So here is a list of chapters. I will tell you what non-relativistic Bose gases are, then we look at thermal equilibrium and identify various limiting regimes of Bose gases in thermal equilibrium. I will then recall second quantization and the grand canonical ensemble. Then I will translate that into a functional integral treatment of thermal equilibrium using Dirac's path integral quantization. That will lead me to the loop ensembles of Schinieber and Zimanzig. And then I will apply this uh, big machinery to uh, you know, discuss various results and conjectures. So as I already mentioned, my collaborators in this endeavor are Antti Knowles, Benjamin Schlein, and Vedran Sohinger. And I thank them for enjoyable collaboration. Then I'm grateful to David Bridges and Daniel Ulci for various useful comments and for teaching me various things that one should know about. I'm also very grateful to Alessandro Pizzo for many inspiring discussions and collaboration on, for example, quantum chains that also include lattice both gases. And uh, since it is warm and maybe a little sticky, let's take it easy. All right, now, so what is a non-relativistic Bose gas? We consider a quantum gas of bosonic atoms, such as atomic hydrogen, helium or rubidium, confined to a box, lambda, in physical space. Rd, but D will be typically two or three, but sometimes for mathematical reasons, I might also look at d greater or equal to four. And let's just imagine lambda as a cube with sides of length L. For simplicity, we assume that the atoms are spinless. The spin would not be a problem, but it's easier to, uh, to uh, just consider spinless atoms. The Hamiltonian Hn of such a gas is a certain operator that acts on the Hilbert space of the system, which is simply an n-fold symmetric tensor product of the L2 space of lambda. And the Hamiltonian is given by a sum of kinetic energies and then uh, a sum of two-body interaction potentials multiplied with a coupling constant lambda. Capital M is the mass of the atom. I said Planck's constant to one. And this constant lambda is a coupling constant that will be always taken to be non-negative. So V is a two-body potential of positive type. Sometimes it might also be fun to assume that it's point 
pointwise positive. I suppose it's continuous and of integrable decay. Now, for simplicity, I will choose periodic boundary conditions at the boundary of the box lambda, but I guess the boundary conditions don't really matter too much. In any event, then uh, the Hamiltonian HN for N bosons in the box is a self-adjoint operator on the Hilbert space script H sub N for no matter what the value of N. We're interested in studying the statistical mechanics of such systems in thermal equilibrium at the positive particle density rho. The density is defined to be the number of N of particles in the box divided by the volume of the box and at the positive temperature T. Let's look at thermal equilibrium according to the ideas of Boltzmann, Einstein and Gibbs, the equilibrium state of a Bose gas at density rho and temperature T is given by a certain density matrix rho sub n acting on this Hilbert space H sub n and rho sub n is the inverse of a certain normalization factor times the exponential of minus beta H n. N here is the density rho times the volume of the box and beta is the inverse temperature. The normalization factor Z sub lambda is called the canonical partition function. It, has to, it is chosen so that the trace of rho sub n equals one. Now for the sake of mathematical precision, uh, one might occasionally want to replace physical space Rd by a lattice set D in order not to worry about short distance singularities and the lattice spacing will be denoted by epsilon. It is convenient to introduce somewhat different uh, parameters and avoid redundancies. I denote beta divided by m by nu and I will vary nu and, uh, and in fact I will set beta to one later on and then um, the coupling constant lambda is either a constant lambda naught or sometimes for certain purposes I set lambda equal to a constant lambda sub lambda naught times nu squared. Lambda naught will be fixed. So I will vary nu and lambda naught and set beta to one. Uh, as I already mentioned, for certain purposes, it is interesting to consider both gases with different numbers, capital N of species of atoms. I assume they all have mass capital M and interact through the same two body potential little v. So what are the parameters? The parameters are the lattice spacing epsilon the density rho, uh, it will be replaced by the chemical potential later on, the parameter nu, which is basically the inverse mass of the atoms, this constant lambda naught that uh, determines the strength of the two body interaction and the number capital N of atom species. We will be interested in the following limiting regimes. Epsilon tends to zero, this is the continuum limit, I will, in fact, in this talk, I will not discuss uh, lattice both gases. I will always be in the continuum limit. Then we will consider the limit nu tends to zero, meaning that the mass of the atoms will tend to infinity, with lambda fixed to be a constant lambda naught. This is the classical particle limit. I will also consider the mean field limit, which is the limit nu tends to zero with lambda given by a constant lambda naught times nu squared. We might also want to call this the Euclidean field theory limit. This has been a popular limit in recent times. Uh, I don't know whether there are particularly good reasons, but it's a, it's a fun limit to consider. Then we might want to consider the limit where n tends to infinity. This is the spherical model or Berlin Katz limit. Or we might also want to look at the limit where n tends to zero. This is the self-avoiding walk or the Gen limit. 
And of course, we might be interested in taking the thermodynamic limit. If we want to discuss phenomena such as Bose-Einstein condensation, we will definitely have to understand that certain quantities survive the limit when lambda tends to infinity. So what are our goals? Our goals are to analyze some of these limiting regimes. In this talk, I cannot seriously consider all of them. So I will take some examples, for example, the mean field limit. We, uh, the the long-term goal is to understand Bose-Einstein condensation for translation in very both gases in the thermodynamic limit, at least for large values of capital N and for new greater or equal to zero. We might first treat this problem in large and many dimensions, d greater or equal four should be a little simpler than, for example, d equal three. And then we want to understand uh, the limiting system that arises when I let the two body potential approach a repulsive delta function potential. And this will turn out to be interesting in connection with uh, analyzing lambda phi to the fourth theory in various dimensions. I will certainly say more about that later on in this talk. So let's now introduce the grand canonical ensemble and second quantization. It, will, it turns out that it's convenient to use the grand canonical ensemble for many purposes. The particle number n may then fluctuate, but its mean value, the, expectation, the expected value of n in the equilibrium state, should be given by the density of the gas times the volume of the box. And this can be tuned by introducing a chemical potential mu. Physicists always call, uh, call it mu, but my, my colleagues are mathematicians, so they insisted to call it kappa. And the relationship between mu and kappa is given by beta mu equals minus mu times kappa. Second quantization. That's, of course, something well known to everybody in the audience. Let's introduce Fox space, symmetric Fox space. It's simply the direct sum over all values of the particle number of the n-fold symmetric tensor product of the L2 space over the box lambda. That's Fox space. On Fox space, we introduce the usual creation and annihilation operators which satisfy the canonical commutation relations. A phi commutes with another phi, a phi star commutes with another phi star, but the commutator of phi nu x with phi star nu y is nu times the delta function of x minus y. Uh, the Fox space mm -hmm. contains a zero particle state, which has the property that it is annihilated by all the annihilation, particle annihilation operators by new effects. Uh, these uh, notions can be generalized to n species of bosons, which just replace uh, coordinates x by x comma a, where a labels the particle species. All right. Then we can rewrite the Hamiltonian in second quantized notation. That is equation four, uh, which I'm sure everybody knows. If I had written these slides today, I would have called the parameter rho in equation four new times rho. But unfortunately, when I prepared the slides, uh, I forgot the fact of new. And I didn't want to change it anymore because I'm sure I would have forgotten some of the changes. Anyway, so this is the equation four is the Hamiltonian for an arbitrary number of bosons in the box lambda. And it's an operator that acts on Fox space F sub lambda. What's the grand partition function? The grand partition function is a function of nu and rho. It's called xi sub lambda of nu and rho, and it is defined to be the trace of exponential minus the Hamiltonian in second quantization. And it will be the normalization factor of 
the density matrix that describes thermal equilibrium in the grand canonical ensemble. Besides this grand partition function, whose logarithm of course defines the thermodynamic potential, it's also interesting to introduce the reduced density matrices, which are expectations of products of creation and annihilation operators in the thermal equilibrium state in the grand canonical ensemble. There are similar formulae for, uh, for many species of bosons. Uh, we might also want to introduce time-dependent correlations, but I won't have any reason to consider them in this talk, so let's not look at them. Now for the following, and since this is apparently a series of seminars about uh, field theory and probability and so on, it is good to introduce a functional integral formalism. Functional integral quantization was invented by Dirac in a relatively little known paper from the early 30s, which I consider to be one of the truly ingenious papers uh, at the beginning of quantum theory. So I will use his ideas to quantize both gases using functional integrals. So in particular, I want to express the grand partition function, capital Xi, and the reduced P particle density matrices, little gamma sub P, in terms of path integrals or functional integrals. For this purpose, I first introduce a formal Lebesgue integration measure which of course mathematically is nonsense, but it's just a notation. It's called d phi bar wedge d phi, and it's formally given by this right-hand side, which of course doesn't make much sense, but let's not worry about it. And now, once I have done that, I can define the grand partition function to be the functional integral of d phi bar wedge d phi with the integrand being given by the exponential of minus an integral over an imaginary time variable tor over the interval zero nu, and then a quadratic piece, and then a quartic piece that will describe the interactions. Now, d phi bar wedge d phi times the exponential of the quadratic piece in, in the action functional this looks like a Gaussian measure. It's actually not really a measure. It's a complex Gaussian, and it doesn't really have a very clear mathematical status. But it can be used to do formal calculations, since we, after all, know how to integrate Gaussians. And that's all this is really good for. Now, in this Gaussian, there is something like an inverse covariance that we call k naught. What is k naught? Well, k naught is a differential operator. Uh, it is given by d by d tau. Tau is this imaginary time variable minus the Laplacian over two. The Laplacian acting on the spatial coordinates x plus one. All right. Now you might think this is a nice inverse covariance, but in fact it's not because d by d tau, of course, is not a very pleasant operator. Um, in order to end up with both statistics, I have to be I have to impose periodic boundary conditions at the endpoints of the interval of imaginary times, namely at tau equals zero and nu. For later purposes, I generalize the definition of this operator k to an operator k of sigma, which is d by d tau minus Laplacian over 2 plus 1 plus i sigma of tau and x. Sigma of tau and x turns out to be a certain random field. In fact, it's a Gaussian random field whose law is given by a Gaussian probability measure. This is now an honest Gaussian probability measure on a space of distributions over the Cartesian product zero nu cross lambda. 
and it has mean zero and the covariance of this Gaussian measure, which I denote by C, is given by delta of tau minus tau prime times lambda over nu times the two body potential V. That's the covariance. That, since V has been assumed to be a positive type, this is really a good positive quadratic form as it should be. All right. Now I inter use the Hubbard Stratonovich transformation to rewrite equation seven. Why this is called Hubbard Stratonovich rather than Fourier transformation, only physicists know, and apparently I'm not a physicist. I think it's a mis misnomer, but ne never mind. So using equations seven, the Dirac expression for the equilibrium functional integral of the both gas and eight, the Gaussian measure for sigma, we can write xi sub lambda to be equal to a constant times the integral over phi bar and phi, and then an integral over the rounded field sigma, e to the i n theta sigma, theta is some phase factor only depending on sigma, I will define it shortly, and then exponential of minus integral from zero to nu, the tau integral over the box dx, of sum of particle species from one to couple n, phi bar sub a of tau and x, k sigma applied to phi sub a, evaluated in tau and, at tau and x. Well, now we can interchange the integrations over the phi bars to phi and sigma. And since the measure is now Gaussian in phi bar phi, we can explicitly carry out the phi bar phi integration. And the integral of a Gaussian is a determinant. So we get by interchanging the integrations over phi bar phi and sigma, we get that this grand partition function is given by the Gaussian integral d mu sub lambda sigma of e to the i n times this phase factor theta of sigma and then times the determinant of the operator k sigma to the power minus the number of particle species. Now the phase factor theta of, uh, theta of sigma is simply rho divided by nu times the integral from zero to nu over the tau of over tau and then the integral over the box of sigma of tau and x. So, yes, so I already mentioned this equation simply follows by interchanging the integrations, the order of integration. For an ideal Bose gas, which has zero coupling constant, xi sub lambda naught, the, the, the grand partition function of an ideal Bose gas is simply determinant k naught to the power minus n, which is independent of sigma. So I can write the ratio of the gram partition function of the interacting gas and the ideal gas to be given by the integral over the Gaussian integral over sigma of e to the i n theta sigma, determinant of k sigma divided by the determinant of k naught to the power minus n. Now let's suppose we have a matrix A with a positive real part. Then we have learned in school that the determinant of A is the same as exponential trace log A. And then I use an integral representation for the logarithm to find that this is equal to exponential minus integral from zero to infinity dt trace of A plus T inverse minus one plus t inverse. So that's just a simple calculation. I apply this wonderful formula to rewrite the right hand side of equation 10. And I get that the ratio of the gram partition function for the interacting gas divided by the gram partition function for the ideal gas is given by the 
Gaussian functional integral over the random field sigma e to the i n theta of sigma e to the n integral from zero to infinity dt trace of k sigma plus t inverse minus k naught plus t inverse. So you see n appears now as a, a parameter. You can make n take arbitrary complex values, basically. And if lambda is equal to one over n, then the Gaussian measure d mu lambda of sigma is also of the form e to the minus n times something quadratic in sigma. So if you may, you can now do, if, if n becomes large, you can use the saddle point method to calculate this ratio of grand partition functions. And that's the subject of the one, of, one upon n expansion, which can be developed very systematically for both gases. It's, in fact, I thought this had never been done, but it turns out that Jean-Zine Justin, who was always an enthusiast of one, one upon n expansions, he actually more or less considered this for both gases not totally sure that he actually worked out the details, but he certainly understood how to do this. Now, as you see in equation 11, we find Green's functions of the operators k of sigma and k naught in the exponent. So we better invent the formula to express these Green's functions. And that's the next topic I have to address. Uh, remember that the boundary conditions in Tor, in this imaginary time variable, are periodic. So, the Green's function of the operator k sigma, maybe I should repeat what it is, k sigma is given by d by d Tor minus the Laplacian over 2 plus 1 plus i sigma of Tor and x. So the Green's function of this operator with periodic boundary conditions can be written as an infinite series, sum L from zero to infinity, heavy side step function evaluated at tau minus tau prime plus L nu, plus the heat kernel gamma at times tau and tau prime minus L nu, with a potential I sigma plus one plus T. So uh, let's, remi let's remind ourselves what this heat kernel is. The heat kernel gamma, tau, tau prime, and q, where q is the potential, the one body potential, is the solution of the following differential equation d by d tau, gamma of tau, tau prime, and q equals Laplacian over 2 minus q applied to gamma, with the condition that when tau equals tau prime, gamma should be the identity. Now this equation 13 can be solved by using Wiener integrals. And that's of course the famous Feynman Katz formula. Gamma of tau tau prime and Q, integral kernel evaluated at X and Y is equal to the Wiener integral over all Brownian paths that go from x to y in a, in a time tau minus tau prime, and then e to the minus integral from zero to tau minus tau prime, ds, q of s plus tau prime, omega of s. So s is a, a so, so to say, a time variable that parameterizes the Brownian paths that are denoted by omega. Now, if we plug this Feynman Katz expression for the E kernel uh, into equation 12 for the Green's function of the operator k sigma, we find, and then we, we, we plug the formula for this Green's function back into expression 11 for the Gram partition function, we find the formula. Gram partition function for the interacting both gas divided by Gram partition function for the ideal gas is given by integral over the Gaussian integral over sigma e to the i n times this phase and then e to the n and then there is this series 
over L from one to infinity of, uh, uh, you know, of this difference of heat kernels. It is very nice that an ambiguity at L equals zero is canceled when you look at this ratio of partition functions. So in fact, L equals zero doesn't contribute. And uh, you can now express these heat kernels in terms of the Wiener integrals and th that gives the, the right hand side of equation 15. If you go back to equation 14 and set the potential Q to be I sigma, you immediately see that the modulus of the heat kernel gamma toto prime I sigma is bounded by the heat kernel gamma toto to prime and zero. If you use this in 15, you immediately see that the ratio of the interacting gram partition function by the gram partition function of the ideal gas is bounded above by one. Of course, that can also be seen immediately from the expression in uh, second quantization. But it's nice that it comes out so simply in this uh, path integral formalism. All right, now I want to use this equation 15 to derive Geneva's Brownian loop gas first. And then we will see that Simancic is really the limit of Schinieber as nu tends to zero. And that's also historically how it happened. Schinieber's work came first and it inspired Simancic to look at the certain Brownian loop gas representation of scale of field theories that he did in, in the Varenna lectures in 1968. So, we expand the exponential of equation of the right hand side in equation 15 into a power series and then carry out the integration over the random field sigma term by term. To describe the result, we define a two loop interaction potential V of omega and omega prime. Omega and omega prime are two Brownian loops of length nu times L omega and nu times L omega prime respectively. And then uh, this V of omega omega prime is given by this, uh, you know, right hand side, which I'm not going to read to you. You can just look at it and enjoy the expression. And then if omega equals omega prime, it's maybe fun to define it a little differently. I could have kept the same definition, but then I would have summed here not over ordered pairs Rs, but over arbitrary pairs Rs. So this, these are the definitions of interaction potentials between Brownian loops. All right, so let's now uh, expand, as I said, expand the right hand side of number 15, do the integral over sigma, and then what we find is the following expression, the gram partition function of the interacting gas divided by the gram partition function of the ideal gas is a certain constant, that doesn't really matter, some little m from zero to infinity, capital N, to the power little n divided by little m factorial, and then a sum over many uh, uh, variables u1 up to un, these are points in the box lambda, and then uh, a factor that has something to do with the chemical potential, tuning the density of the gas, and then Wiener integrals, e to the minus sum of over these uh, two, two loop interaction potentials. Now this is nothing but Geneva's representation of the gram canonical partition function of the Bose gas with n species of particles and it's represented as a statistical sum over Brownian loops in an interacting loop soup, if you like. 
And again, note that n appears as a parameter that in principle can be given any complex value. I tend to think this is maybe the simplest derivation of Schinheber's representation of both gases as, as a sort of loop soups. Of course, his original derivation was probably in some sense more rigorous, but, but much more tedious. Now, it's easy to generalize these expressions to uh, expressions for reduced density matrices, then in the expression for reduced density matrices, the, you will find open Brownian paths besides the Brownian loops. And these open Brownian paths connect points xj to x prime, so pi j, where pi is an arbitrary permutation that uh, leaves the particle species invariant. All right, so that's the expression for the reduced density matrices. Of course, they are in some sense more important than the gram partition function, but in a one hour talk, I cannot possibly look at all these expressions. It doesn't make sense. All right, now I want to sketch how Simon characterizes as the mean field limit, the limit when u tends to zero with lambda equals a constant times nu squared. Uh, and, and how does this work? Well, you look at Schinheber and you find out that since nu, appear, nu tends to zero, if you divide by nu and multiply by nu, then these prefactors are Riemann sum approximations to integrals. In other words, the LK times nu becomes an integration variable that I denote by capital T. And so formally, and in fact, it's more than a formal uh, observation, it can be proven, uh, these expressions of Schinheber are Riemann sum approximations to expressions that Simancic introduced. And they are the following expressions. The limit when u tends to zero, gram partition function of the interacting gas divided by gram partition function of the ideal gas is a limit as a certain parameter delta tends to zero, a constant that depends on delta to the power n. It doesn't depend on anything else. And then a sum over all possible particle numbers from zero to infinity, capital N to the n divided by n factorial, and then these are integrals. Delta, the parameter delta has been introduced in order to regularize these integrations over the t variables, which are divergent at t equals zero. So you have to regularize them and then in the end take the limit as delta tends to zero. All right. So uh, the two loop potentials now in the limit where nu tends to zero become simply integrals of the two body potential little v evaluated at omega t minus omega prime t prime t is uh, integrated over all possible times between zero and capital t and uh, t prime is integrated between zero and capital t prime so in other words you know we had uh, these v omegas uh, these uh, R nu and S nu also become continuous variables when nu tends to zero, and you end up formally with the expression that I have written at the bottom of this slide. All right, good. Now we would like to identify the expression of Simancic with something that arises in a scalar Euclidean field theory. That's the next topic to be coped with. Suppose d mu sub v of eta is a Gaussian probability measure on the space of tempered distributions over the box lambda with mean zero and the covariance lambda naught divided by m plus one times v. You can think of eta as being really the average of the random field sigma over tau. Over over this imaginary time variable. 
So the, the dependence on the imaginary time variable drops out in the random field ADA. We then find that the right hand side of 19 that I just derived as the limit where nu tends to zero of Schinebel, this uh, limiting expression is equal to a limit of a, con a divergent constant that depends on delta to the power n and then the Gaussian integral d over eta of the exponential of this uh, big sum. Now I do, I do Feynman cuts in reverse. This uh, Feynman cuts integral, of course, is nothing but the trace of a certain heat kernel, the trace of e to the capital T Laplacian over two plus i eta, obviously. And so I can block this reverse expression, well, this expression into 20 and carry out the T integration. Then we find that the right hand side of 20 approaches d mu v of eta, this Gaussian measure of e to the i n theta of eta. That's again a phase factor that I will define shortly. And then exponential minus n trace log minus Laplacian over two plus one minus i eta minus logarithm of minus Laplacian over two plus one. That's what comes out simply by doing the T integration. But remember the formula for determinants of matrices that we had before. This formula here on this slide at the bottom, if you apply this formula in reverse, you find that this expression is nothing but the Gaussian integral over eta e to the i n theta of eta times this ratio of determinants to the power minus n. Now it turns out the right choice of theta of eta is to sort of realize the, the right kind of weak ordering in the limiting expression. And the right kind of weak ordering is found by choosing theta of eta to be to cancel the term linear in this ratio of determinants. I should incidentally mention something. One of the listeners of this talk is Erhard Seiler. And Erhard Seiler is the world's expert on determinants and renormalized determinants. And whatever I know about determinants, I learned from Erhard many, many years ago. So, this expression 21, of course, arises as follows. Let us introduce a complex scale of field with capital N components, phi vector of x is phi one of x up to phi n of x. X is a point in the box. It's complex, this field is complex and it has capital N components. I assume it, there is an action functional S sub lambda phi given by a quadratic piece that's this piece here, and then a cortic piece that describes interactions. And in this cortic piece, the two body potential V reappears. Now, by Hubbard Stratonovich in reverse, the right side of 21 is the same as the interfunctional integral over this complex and component scalar field, phi vector of exponential minus the action functional S sub lambda of phi. It's just Hubbard Stratonovich or Fourier in reverse. So the n tends to infinity limit of the right hand side, of course, is you know obviously what uh, Berlin and Katz called the spherical model. Uh, this model in the limit where n tends to infinity, to infinity has been shown by Berlin and Katz to have a phase transition with spontaneous symmetry breaking. This, they showed this by using saddle point methods. Now their ideas can actually be applied not just to the mean field limit of the Bose gases, but to Bose gases themselves when you let them become large. And uh, 
So the claim is that in the limit where the number of particle species, uh, capital N, tends to infinity, we understand Bose-Einstein condensation. I will say a little more about that later on. In the limit where the two-body potential approaches the delta function potential, the right side of 22 defines Euclidean lambda phi to the fourth theory. So we conclude that the hard core Bose gas in D dimensions can be viewed as a regularization of Euclidean lambda phi to the fourth theory. Of course, I'm sure many people have made this observation, but this is a surprisingly useful observation to understand what one should expect about scale of field theories. So let's now uh, soon come to the conclusion. I will now summarize the kinds of results that you can derive by using the machinery I developed in the preceding uh, four sections. Result number one concerns the mean field limit. The ideas just reviewed in the previous section, equations 17 through 22. Maybe I briefly flash them once more. You know, in the sort of in the tradition of semantic, flash them briefly. Uh, these uh, equations imply that for a suitable choice of the density of the Bose gas as a function of nu, and it turns out that this density must diverge as the parameter nu approaches zero in dimension two and three. The limit as nu tends to zero of the Bose gases exist in dimension two and three, and this, and this limit is given by the Euclidean field theory that I defined here in, in uh, equation 22. So this is actually a theorem, and I think the formalism I developed in this talk is a very natural formalism to prove the theorem. Our friends Levin, Nam, and Rougeri have used operator methods to prove basically the same theorem. But in some sense, I believe this functional integral approach might be a little more natural. So the proof, you know, I have basically sketched the proof in the previous section. If you want to be rigorous, it's a little more complicated. First, you have to understand what it means that the density tends to infinity. This is really a matter of weak ordering. These are uh, operators phi squared that appear in the interaction term of the action. And uh, so that's not too difficult to understand. And, uh, and then you figure out that both the ground partition function of the interacting Bose gas has uh, the integrand of the functional integral expression for the ground partition function satisfies a nice upper bound and the integrand of the partition function of the field theory also satisfies a nice upper bound. And so it's enough when you want to prove that the mean field limit exists, it is enough to prove that the exponents in these exponentials converge in, say, an L2 sense. And that's what we established in the paper. This, you know, is, is sounds like a sort of exercise in constructive quantum field theory. Turns out it requires a little bit of technology to do it. But we have done that in this joint paper with uh, Antti Knowles, Benjamin Schlein, and Vedran Sohino. All right, so that much about the mean field limit. Now let's look at triviality of lambda phi fourth theory in dimension d greater or equal to four. This is really more a conjecture than a, a theorem. Although at my age, you know, you become a little more tolerant. You don't really need proofs for everything you say. So, as I mentioned, to get lambda phi four theory, we should look at both gases with two body potentials that are given by repulsive delta function potentials. Uh, 
uh, you can construct these Bose gases in any dimension D. And it is known simply by using, you know, theorems about Schrodinger operators with delta function, repulsive delta function, two body potentials, that in dimension greater or equal to four, the delta function potentials are not felt. The interacting Bose gas is identical to the ideal Bose gas. It just does, the particles do not feel the interaction potential. Of course, this has something to do with the statement that two Brownian paths in dimension d greater or equal to four never intersect, which was a theorem by Erdős and Taylor. Now, in view of the results, I just uh, state in section five and in result one, the mean field limit, this leads to the conjecture that lambda phi to the fourth D theory is trivial, meaning it's equivalent to a Gaussian free field theory in dimension D greater equal to four, because when you regularize it with a delta function Bose gas, this delta function Bose gas is actually an ideal gas. Now, of course, we are sort of interchanging two limits, the mean field limit and the limit where the two-body potential tends to delta function, of course, this would have to be justified. Now, uh, we, we understand that the theorem is true in dimension larger than four for one complex scalar field, namely for a, or, or, or if you prefer for both gases of one particle species. This is a, an old result that goes back to 1982. It is also, it's also almost proven in dimension four, but there was always a little small piece missing. This piece actually turned out to be not so small and it was supplied by Eisenman and Duminil Copin, but only for real scalar fields in D equals four dimensions. That's a fairly recent result. It's actually a nice analysis. Uh, so you might enjoy looking at their paper. Result three, classical particle limit. Consider a Bose gas in the continuum limit at finite temperature, in the limit where the mass of the atoms tends to infinity, but the interaction strength is kept constant. This is the limit where nu tends to zero with coupling constant lambda taken to be a constant. All right, then you go back to the genie loop gas representation for the gram partition function and just think about what happens when the mass that appears in the expressions for the Wiener measures becomes large. It turns out that these Wiener measures concentrate on paths that are infinitely short, namely paths that start at UK and end at UK and never get anywhere in between. Well, if that is the case, then these V of omega i, omega j become just the classic, the ordinary two body potentials evaluated at the starting and end points of these paths, which are denoted by u i and u j. And then you have to do the u integral and what you see appearing if you choose the chemical potential appropriately is simply the expression for the gram partition function of a classical gas of point particles interacting with this two body potential V, this expression 26. Results of this type were of course known, but I think our formalism gives a very short and slick way of understanding this. Number four, thermodynamic limit. Since I'm running a little late, I think I should just refer you to Daniel Ulci. We have analyzed the thermodynamic limit using cluster expansions. And it, this is useful if you want to understand where Bose-Einstein condensation might set in, namely, at, uh, in fact, you know, by showing that in certain regions, the, this Gibbs potential is analytic in the parameters and so on. Uh, so these cluster expansions have become thanks to the work of people like Daniel, have become fairly routine and can be applied here. 
All right. Then uh, I already mentioned the limit, the spherical model limit, where capital N tends to infinity. Uh, I choose the coupling constant to be la a constant lambda naught divided by n plus one. And then uh, I figure out that this, uh, you know, e to the minus lambda naught over nu v minus one becomes of order lambda naught divided by n plus one. In other words, very sh small, but every loop, uh, every loop in the expansion carries a factor n because you have the sum over n particle species. If you now insist that the limiting expression remains finite, then the factors of n in the numerator and the denominator have to cancel. And you find out that in, a, in the cluster expansion, only so-called cactus diagrams survive. These diagrams can be resummed, and the result of the resummation is that the system approaches an ideal Bose gas of one species of particles, but with a renormalized chemical potential as n tends to infinity. This limiting system is known to exhibit Bose-Einstein condensation. So we would expect that for sufficiently large values, uh, incidentally, the limiting system is known to exhibit Bose-Einstein condensation in dimension d greater or equal to three, I should have said. So this, of course, suggests that Bose-Einstein condensation should be a theorem at least for large values of n. To start this question, we should probably attempt to use renormalization group methods in the hubbard stratonovich representation of the interacting Bose gas that uh, was derived in formulas 10, 11. The, you know, I mentioned there that uh, the large n limit is really a saddle point limit, and so we should expand about the saddle points using renormalization group methods. I discussed this with David Bridges a little bit, and he, he thinks this is a pretty hard problem. It's not something that they have sort of in a drawer of their desks, so it would probably require a fairly serious effort to finish this job. All right, then uh, six, the limit where n tends to zero, and the self-avoiding walk conjecture. In the limit where n tends to zero, all diagrams with loops in the cluster expansion disappear. The partition function, grand partition function tends to one. But of course, more interesting is the study of a reduced density matrix, gamma two xy, and uh, in fact, it turns out that uh, the terms that contribute to gamma 2xy in the limit where n tends to zero just show that this is a regularized version of the Edwards, Edwards Anderson model of self voiding walk. So I expect that in dimension d greater equal to four, the critical properties of the theory for very tiny n are identical to those of ordinary Brownian motion. So, but again, this remains to be proven. In any event, I think when you look at these expansions, you develop the idea that for n near zero and for n close to infinity, there is hope that we can understand phenomena such as Bose-Einstein condensation. Well, I'm afraid that's it. That's it for today. Now, since we're living through, you know, difficult and rather strange times, I would like to remind you that people who were more clever than we are, such as Grotendieck, already thought that in 1970 times were pretty strange, and that's why he created this movement, Survivre et Vivre, and it's now 50 years later, and he's initiative would be more important than ever. So please try to read this little uh, quote from Grotendieck. So with this, I would like to conclude this lecture and I thank you for your attention. 
And of course, I'm happy to take questions. Now it seems that everybody sleeps, is sleeping. So there are no questions or comments. You can also type in the chat box if you uh, don't feel like uh, speaking up. Chat Thank you box. for this uh, very nice talk, by the way. You're very welcome. So is there, are there any comments or questions? Yes. So I think you said that you can control the mean field limit for the two dimensional and also the three dimensional case Absolutely, yes, by only taking care of the weak ordering properly. Is that correct? Yes, that's the uh, only. You see, as long as V is a smooth two body potential of positive type, uh, only the phi squares have to be weak ordered properly. Okay, so, so in it's case, exactly. The, the, the subtleties of renormalization would only appear if you uh, let V approach a delta function. Potential. Okay, so you get, you get something different from 543, something easier than... It's a little easier than 543, absolutely, yes. It's in some sense maybe what you might want to call a baby problem in constructive quantum mm -hmm. theory. But it turned out it kept people busy perhaps because they didn't quite take the right point of view. In any event, now in this formalism, it has turned out that the problem is relatively, relatively easy. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. the paper is you know, pretty long, actually, if you include all the details. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? Why are there further comments or questions? I think there's a, a comment in the chat. Let's see. Jörg, uh, can you? I don't, I don't see where I can turn on my... There's a, a little, uh, like a, a little chat symbol, uh, typically on the bottom. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can start the question directly if you prefer. All right, so uh, start chatting now. But uh, if you click on uh, that, uh, you should be able to see what Daniel uh, said. But uh, otherwise, Daniel, can you just, uh, mm -hmm. just uh, read it aloud? Strangely, I don't see it. Well, uh, okay, I just wanted to ask if the expansion might work for negative chemical potential. Uh, which expansion? So, so the chemical potential would be, in, oh, actually, sorry, positive. Well, that's what I meant. And still with repulsive interactions. Yes, but which expansion are you talking about? Uh, the, the functional integral expression. Yes. With the uh, in this with the sigma field after Herbert Stratonovich, yes. per perfectly. No matter what the chemical potential is, it just works. Ah. Mm -hmm. There's no problem. It's only the when you go to the Schneeber representation or the Simancic re uh, representation, things look a little formal when the chemical potential has the wrong sign. But you shouldn't use those representations to investigate the phase transition. The Schneeber and Simancic are only useful at sort of low density and weak coupling. Otherwise, you should, you should use the Herbert Stratunovich uh, representation involving this field sigma. Mm -hmm. Because it's a bit related to a question. Um, so the, the conjecture is that the critical chemical potential should be strictly positive. Yes, absolutely. But nobody has proved it, I believe. Yes, but you see, when you go to the meme, uh, to the spherical model limit, then you can start to prove such things. Of course, the problem is that's the n tends to infinity limit, and we would, in the end, like to have results for n large, but definitely not equal to infinity. And, and of course, that is so far not, uh, then nobody has results, at least no rigorous results. Yes. Um, hello, Jörg, it's Manfred speaking. Hello, Manfred. Good uh, to hear your for voice. Nice talk. Um, I, can, you, can you repeat how, uh, I mean, I some, somehow missed it, how, how this uh, uh, Time derivative term dropped out when you went to the Berlin cuts model. I, I, 
No, no, in the in the Berlin cuts, it does not drop out. Oh, it doesn't drop out. I mean, I no, no. You see, the spherical model limit of the Bose gas still yeah. has this d by d tor inside the okay. the, the, yeah. the imaginary time stays, but you can use large n methods. Mm -hmm. It becomes a you know basically a, a saddle point problem. Yeah. Uh, Hi, Jörg. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, I, I would just comment though that we don't know how to use this this formalism in the low temperature regime very well. It's really uh, more high temperature. I think this is no, really no, the no, 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 no. You see, the sigma representation yeah. works very well at low temperature. But what I mean is, you we don't know how to prove phase transitions that way. It's well, we don't, uh, I agree because nobody knows yet how to how to prove this Bose Einstein condensation. But you well, see, for example, these these methods are are probably I, I would like to hear your comment about this, but Suppose we simplify the model uh, yeah. and we make it a, a, a spin system, right? Rather than a field theory. Uh, yes. just a, just a, I don't hear uh, you at the moment. Then, of course, this is very close to. Oh, uh, you make a you make a spin system. Yes. Instead of a field theory. Yes. Uh, you can make it a quantum spin system, and then, of course, if you do that, this is going to be especially if you take a, a, a sigma model. It, yes. it will, you'll get a loop gas too. Yes. Um, and that loop gas is, is probably, I'm not certain of this, but I would think it would be quite closely related to what you're writing. Yes, but you see, I'm not going to use the loop gas representation if I want to analyze the phase transition. Okay. Definitely not, I tell you which expression. Okay, loop yeah, so how would that look? What would that look like if I, if I were looking at, you know, an O2 or O3 uh, model on the lattice. On the lattice, let's say. Let's, let's try to strip down the... Let's go back a little bit. So uh, you see the good expression to analyze phase transitions. This is equation 10. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so that's the, the analog of that is, is, the, is, the, is, is what we use for... Um, uh, yeah, so that that's the if you do that for for uh, for for five fourth system, that's that's just uh it's just the Hubbard Shortanovich uh, formula. Yes, that yes. We use. But right. we still don't know how to do that for you know uh, we of course we know how to prove phase transitions, but when we'd like to be able to use this formalism for it, and and there there we're lacking it seems to me an understanding of what to do. Uh, it's simplest cases. I, I mean, you know, I, 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 I can. I cannot possibly disagree with you. I think <laughs> nobody, nobody has really used number 10 for a rigorous analysis of a phase transition. Yes. I think well, it, 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 would be, it would be kind of, I mean, yeah. Uh, okay. But yes. you, you see, to, to compute the saddle point, that's definitely possible. Of course. And of, and of course, yeah. then you can see that uh, something strange happens at low but temperature. You still have a complex measure to deal with. That's the problem. Absolutely, yes. That's, that's, there's no doubt about it, yeah. yeah. So, you know, I wish I knew more about it this. <laughs> uh, uh, I think it's nice that when n tends to infinity, you understand what happens, that's for sure. Yes, that's, that's very helpful. Of course. And uh, you understand this mean field limit and the theory in the mean field limit is a little, looks a little easier from the point of view of understanding the phase transition. But it's basically a formal game. And this is why, you see, this is why this quote is here, a great deal of, our work is just playing with equations and seeing what they give. Yes. So it, it did, if you work this out for, for a, a, a Heisenberg model, um, a, a, let's say a, a quantum Heisenberg, would you, what would you get? Uh, I mean, would you get a simpler expression? Um, let's say a ferromagnetic one. The, well, the quantum Heisenberg, this, uh, you know, I wrote the paper quite a long time ago, together with uh, Carlo Albert and Benjamin Schlein and Lucio Ferrari about 
quantum spin systems in the functional integral representation, mm -hmm. you get very similar looking. Yeah. Uh, and in fact, in that case, they turned out to be helpful because we could get a proof of the phase transition in uh, anti-ferromagnets. I see. By using reflection positivity. And these proofs looked like the cl our old classical proof, although the model is quantum. So yes. it was in some sense a little easier than the Dyson Leap Simon proofs. Yeah, I think Daniel has something quite similar, right? Uh, uh, probably. Uh, yes. yes. In any event, so that uh, you can definitely use such ideas on quantum spin systems. Yeah. It has been worked out in, in quite a lot of detail. I see. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, you know, I wish. As you might remember, uh, Rivasso and his co-workers looked at for formulas related to number 10 for phi to the fourth theories. And yes. maybe they were a little, they, they were very optimistic that this was a wonderful approach and turned out it was probably not quite as wonderful as they initially were hoping. So and uh, People tried very hard, I think, uh, yeah. Uh, with this, uh, I, it's a beautiful approach, but one needs to know how to handle these complex phases and all that kind Absolutely, of thing. Absolutely, yeah, that's, just, that's right. All right. Any other comment or question? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, so, what, what uh, is there an interpretation of the n to zero limit? Uh, I because I I think n was the number of particle species, so it's uh, yes. Uh, not completely clear to me what n to to what zero means. <laughs> well, I mean, what what answer do you expect? You see, I mean, it's <laughs> like polymers being the n tends to zero limit of of uh, n component phi to the fourth. So it's very similar in this respect. In fact, the n tends to zero limit of a Bose gas is n particle species is a theory of an interacting Brownian path. And the interaction is, a, is slightly less uh, singular than self-avoiding walk, but it, it goes in that. It's a regularized version of the self-avoiding walk. And okay. that comes, I mean, that's really, uh, you know, a completely regular statement as long as uh, as you are in the high temperature phase, the n tends to zero limit makes sense, and it turns out it, it is a it's a regularized version of the self avoiding walk. Okay, so the interpretation comes via the, the uh, association with the, the model that you find in this limit. Yes. Okay. Right. Thank, thanks. Okay. Well. Any more questions to you, here? Maybe I can just also make a little remark on this uh, to control this large but finite n limit. We have done uh, Rivasso and myself and work on mass generation, for example, in the large n cross Neveu model. Yes. Where the question was also then about controlling the sub uh, leading contributions to these determinants. And then to show that you can uh, control this by constructive methods. And this worked in the presence of a ultraviolet cutoff. So for what is called single scale model, but then cluster expansion, non perturbative cluster expansion for the single scale model. But uh, we were never able to do this uh, when you really had to do also renormalization group construction. Uh, in other words, you, you were not approaching criticality. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So you, you see, I'm sort of counting on the younger generation that includes you to <laughs> actually understand how to deal with such expressions. But uh, in any case, we also use the formulas of Erhard, which you mentioned for, for doing that. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right. All right. 
and maybe another you remark. Should, which, incidentally, you should send me this paper because I'm afraid I probably missed that. I didn't know that you were involved in that too. I can, yes, I can. There are two, one about the cross nerveur and one about the nonlinear sigma model. Okay, yeah, that would certainly be a So opinion. the nonlinear sigma model in, in two dimensions then, or? Yes, uh, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this ultraviolet cutoff. So you want yeah with an ultraviolet cutoff. So then you want to show this mass generation, right? Uh, yeah. 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 Right. Uh, you know, Auntie worked on this a long time ago. Uh, uh, yeah, has, yeah, yeah. This is related to a paper by Auntie. Yeah, yeah. Now the question is, can you do better? Can you? I mean, he had to make n very large to see the mass. And the question is how, and of course you don't want to do that if you have a coupling constant. You want to be able to say it's true for you know, just large n uh, without. But so, what 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 kind of scaling do you need to get the the mass? Uh, I mean, if you take n to infinity, of course, you got the mass. So the question is, how big do you, for a particular coupling constant, how big do you have to make n to see the mass? Well, unfortunately, in these constructive methods, normally it becomes always very big because one over n is the problem. The small parameter which kills yeah, all yeah. these large combinatorics. Right. And it would be nice to. Ha I mean, to improve that would already be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, just another remark, because maybe uh, due to this uh, sanitary crisis, no, but not everybody is aware of it. But uh, you know, maybe uh, some of you know, maybe that on others, I can tell that Jean Genibre died on uh, February. Oh, March, I'm sorry. Uh, to hear that. Really? Uh, this mm. year, yes. That's Very sorry. Sad. I didn't know. He did, so he did a lot. He did a lot for my yeah, I think somewhat because of this lockdown period, uh, um, people, many people are not aware of it. <laughs> yes, right. Look, uh, this he, is he did not uh, the die of the virus, or how is it? You know, uh, unfortunately, there are quite a few scientists who died of the virus. This I do not know. Uh, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I had uh, maybe one question about your reduced density matrix. Yes. Can you get a similar functional integral representation for like the von Neumann entropy or Rene entropy of this, uh, of such a reduced density matrix? Ooh, that, uh, the, my quick answer is I have no idea. <laughs> Never thought about that. Okay. Not quite sure what you mean by it, even. In other words, I don't even know what the question means. What does it mean? We have to reduce density matrices, and now what kind of entropy do you want to associate with them? Well, take a, consider it as an an integral kernel, and yes. uh, take it the trace or trace row log row. Oh, okay. So, yes. Uh, as an, you know, as an right, as okay. some operate expression, or yes, take it to to some power complex power alpha, and then okay. take it and then you would like to have a, a, a functional inter integral expression for for this. Yeah, question. something like this. Yeah. Well, yeah. No, I I haven't thought about this. I would have to look into it. Hmm. Okay. All right. All right, well, uh, thanks, Jörg, again for this uh, nice talk. Thanks to all of you for coming. And uh, as you know, this is going to continue on a monthly basis, uh, we hope so, we hope at least. And uh, you'll be getting regular mail uh, from us or from the other organizers. And we're all, of course, uh, happy about any suggestions for other speakers in the, in the future. Thanks. Well, it was good to see you all. Thanks and uh, have a good, good yeah, day. Yeah, thank you, Jörg. Yeah, it was yeah, really worth. Sure. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you.